Starting off tonight, the title for this uh, Bible study is Love or Truth? Which one do you like better? Both are good. And, and as soon as I, my, my initial uh, reaction would be, oh, I like love a lot better because truth can get me in trouble. But on the other hand, I don't know if you've ever had your parents discipline you and tell you how much they love you as they disciplined you and they're gonna help you learn to be a better, you know, boy, girl, you know, uh, person. And so those times they explained how they loved me and I, I didn't really enjoy those, those particular expressions of love. So, um, so there's some of, some of the good things on both. Um, according to John chapter 13, verse 35, how will the world know that we are Jesus' disciples? By our love. So, um, and that's, that's, that's good and that's interesting. Um, and it says, you know, so if you look at directly the verse, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That seems pretty simple, pretty straightforward. <clears throat> but then that leads me to another question. How will people outside the church know that people inside the church love like Jesus? And at least partly I've given sort of an answer by our actions. They, they can't see the feeling that we have. They can't see our intentions and what we mean or you know, what kind of things we think. About all the, the people outside the church can do is look at our actions and say, well, do I think they're loving or do I think they're not? Now that happens to each of us on an individual basis. People can look at each one of us as an individual and say, is that a loving person or, or not? The, the other possibility though, is if we're talking about a church like Utica Baptist Church, then the question is, what do people in the community think about Utica Baptist Church? Do they think it's a loving church or not? My suspicion is it's gonna have something to do with our actions. If we tell them we love them and we love God, that's a good thing for them to hear us say those words. But I'm not sure they'll believe the words if the actions aren't there also. And so that makes a, a difference in how we interact with people out there. So question, so what is it that pushed me into today's Bible study topic, this love or truth kind of thing? And I'd have to say that it's the culture that we currently live in uh, that pushes me that way because I find that much of what I've grown up with uh, is challenged today, particularly things about God and Christian issues. Oh, that doesn't sound good, does it? Okay, is that better? I must have moved my head at the wrong moment. <clears throat> Okay, so as I go bebopping through life, that's an old term. Kids these days don't know what that means. But as I go bebopping through life, living life, doing whatever, and I see by my culture things I read in the paper, things I see on TV, things I read on the internet, uh, all manner of things that, uh, that challenge what I thought were just basic things that everybody understood and knew. And it doesn't seem like the culture has stayed where I came in. Uh, there's been not only change, there's been a lot of change, at least in my opinion. So when I look at things and I find various challenges, then, then, then there's a couple of responses that you can make to those challenges. I can either ignore the challenge, keep my head down, hope it won't affect me too much, maybe it'll go away. And that's one way that you can deal with it. Or I can take up the challenge that it, it brings me. And so I have a tendency to do that last choice. I have a tendency to say, okay, I'm feeling challenged by what my culture is doing. And so therefore I need to go and take up the challenge and look for answers. See if I can figure out what the heck's going on. What do I need to do? And why is this going on? And those kinds of questions. And so when I take up the challenge, then one of the things that I do is I go looking uh, for information, uh, for people with wisdom, 
for ideas that will help those situations that I'm challenged by. And so one of the challenges we'll find in the next few slides. So here's an interesting slide. You may, may have seen this on the news. And uh, this was, uh, of course, if, if you're not sure you really know those, the guy on the left is George W. Bush, former president. Lady on the right is Ellen DeGeneres. Uh, she's a comedian and um, talk show host, I guess, and, and a number of things. And you notice that they're sitting right next to each other. You notice that both of them seem to be somewhat pleasant. Of course, George Bush's smile could use some work. But, you know, they both look pleasant like they're getting along and, and having each other. Well, one really funny thought I thought was Ellen is a comedian, so she said, people looked at us and they got all upset about our picture, and not one person noticed that I had the new uh, iPhone 11. You can tell because it's got three little cameras instead of two or one. Uh, I thought, you know, because like I have iPhones and I thought that was kind of cute. But anyway, so she says that. Now what she says about it is, why is a gay Hollywood liberal sitting next to a conservative Republican president? I mean, you gotta wonder. How in the world did that happen? Especially that they're looking like they're getting along and they're sort of pleasant feeling instead of like throwing things at each other. And she said, just because I don't agree with someone on everything doesn't mean I'm not going to be friends with them. In the current culture that I live in, my response to her statement is, oh my gosh, are you serious? Nobody says that. Okay, I've heard that occasionally from Christians, but in the culture at large, nobody says that. And so I just like, I, you know, it certainly sent my antenna up going, my goodness. Well, then she went on to say, when I say be kind to one another, I don't mean only the people that think the same way you do. I mean be kind to everyone, doesn't matter. Um, you know, and I'm still sitting there going, I can't believe that somebody would say that, that's not a good, strong, committed Christian, probably a, a, a nice conservative evangelical. I, I would believe those people might say it, but I don't know why somebody in the culture who's not a Christian might say that. And so she, she, she compares, I think, real well to another fellow who had a saying, something like that. And he said, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. Well, that was Jesus in Luke chapter six. You remember there's a, a verse in the Bible that says, if those who are without God do good things that for that they're a law unto themselves. I don't think that means they get salvation because they did something good, but it means that they've done something well and right that you would expect out of Christians, but they're doing it without the benefit of being a Christian and having the Holy Spirit live within them. So as I look at this, all I can say uh, to Ellen is good on you. That's an old Southern term. I wasn't born in the South, but I learned some of them. Uh, so I think she did just stellar in her attitude. Now, when she made that kind of a statement, uh, she said, when we were invited to this game, and it was the, uh, the, uh, Jerry Jones' son who invited her and George Bush to the stadium, and they got tickets and seats, and she came with her wife, so she's, uh, she's gay and she's married to another woman. So the two of them came. You didn't see her wife in the picture and you didn't see, see uh, George Bush's wife in the picture, but you just saw the two of them because they brought in the, the shot tight. And she said, when we were invited, I was aware that I was going to be surrounded with people from very different views and beliefs. And I'm not talking about politics. I was rooting for the Packers. She was in the Dallas Cowboy Stadium in Texas when she said that. She said she had to hide her cheese head. I don't know if you've seen Green Bay and the, the cheese head hats. They had to hide that in her wife's purse so that they could sneak it into the stadium. So uh, she was willing to, to go ahead and, and go into hostile territory, at least in a, in a football sense. Now, Anderson, you may know Susan Sarandon. She is uh, an actress, well-known, done a lot of good act, acting work. And uh, she's very liberal, and I would consider her pretty left besides liberal. They're, in my mind, two separate things these days. And she said, but missing the point entirely, DeGeneres framed the issue as simply a matter of her hanging out with someone with different opinions, not a man repeatedly accused of being a war criminal. 
Susan Sarandon wasn't going to give an inch, it looks like, and she wasn't going to sit next to somebody and be able to get along with them because she had a pretty strong opinion about who George W. Bush was. And so she criticized uh, Ellen DeGeneres for making the statement and showing up in the picture sitting next to him. Well, there was another actress, Reese Witherspoon, and she said, uh, thank you for this important reminder, Ellen. Now, I like, uh, I like Reese Witherspoon. I liked her particularly in the Spider-Man movies that she did. Um, but she had, she's done a number of, of roles. She's a well-known and does not, she, let's see, she was in Legally Blonde, if some of you know that film. And so, I don't know why it's doing that. So, uh, and so she, she later took down her tweet because she got criticized so harshly from the left. And so even though I think she probably thought what Ellen said was good, she took it down because she was getting a lot of flack for it. So uh, when I was in college, um, this was long before I met Amy. Uh, I, uh, I was dating this girl who uh, lived in Lincoln, Nebraska. And she got uh, tickets. She got tickets for us to go to the Nebraska football game. Some of you may not have lived in that part of the country and don't really know, but back in that day when I was in college, many, many years ago, uh, there was the Big Eight. The Big Eight's now the Big 12, by the way, but there was the Big Eight back then. And in the Big Eight, almost every year, either Nebraska or Oklahoma won the Big Eight, almost every year. And most of the time it was Nebraska for as long as I was you know, remember and going. I saw Nebraska, they would come to our home and to our stadium. We would be ahead of them by two touchdowns going into the fourth quarter and we'd still lose. And the reason we'd still lose is because Nebraska had the most amazing offensive line in the entire uh, NCAA. They had people who their, their first string and their second string and their third string were interchangeable and their third string could play first string for anybody else in the country. That meant by the time you got to fourth quarter, Missouri's defense is sucking wind, and they can't even possibly keep up. And, you know, they got a fresh set of legs in there, you know, blowing them off the offensive line and scoring touchdowns uh, and, and winning the game. And that happened over and over. I, I was really a frustrated Missouri fan. But there was this one time, this girl who lived in Lincoln, Nebraska, got us football tickets to go to the game. And so I, uh, I drive over to Lincoln and, and stay at her parents' house overnight, and then the next morning, we're going to go to the game. In Nebraska, they don't have a professional team of any kind in the state. No professional football team, baseball team, basketball team, whatever. What they have is the Nebraska Cornhuskers. That's the, the, the Nebraska professional team. And so when, when we went to the, to the stadium, I was absolutely amazed because everybody on the street wore a lot of red. That's their school color. Everybody had red windbreakers. Some of them had red pants. Some of them wore red hats. I mean, everything. I think they even took some of the street lights and they put a little cellophane over the green light to turn it red too. Everything was red. I mean, they were big because it was their team going to play. And Nebraska did so well every year. <clears throat> for you guys who are really into college football, they were the guys that did the fumble ruski. And they did that first. So they're, they're a storied team. So, um, so we go to this game and we're watching all this happening. And as, as we get into the stadium, I found out that, that my girlfriend had gotten tickets in the student section. I don't know if you know anything, but students are a lot more rabid than the average ordinary calm adult. And we had to go down a long row. There, like, there were aisles on the outside, but not in the middle. We had to go down a long row to get to our seats. And as we went down there, there was at least twice, maybe three times, whereas I'm passing some guy, I mean, you know, stadiums, like, you know, you're, you're shoulder to shoulder, and at least twice, somebody said, boy, you better take off that hat. And at least twice I said, ain't gonna do it, and kept walking really fast. <laughs> and so I got to my seat and watched the game. <clears throat> I think there was only three apple cores that hit my hat during the game. None of them knocked it off. I kept, oh, I didn't tell you, I had a Missouri cowboy hat with a gold M on the black background. 
Um, so yeah, I did that to the Nebraska football game. I was young and not really all that smart then. I was enthusiastic though. And so uh, strangely enough, at the end of the game, Missouri won. I was thrilled. And my next thought was, I wonder if they're gonna beat me underneath the stadium's uh, bleachers. And as we walked out, there were a number of people who saw me with my Missouri hat on that said, good game, you guys played well. And I just thought, really? Seriously, you're, you're being nice? And, and they were. Well, so the interesting thing then is when you go into a territory that is not gonna be happy with you, then the question is how are you gonna get along in that situation, how are they gonna be? <clears throat> you may have seen this, uh, this was a, a little interview on Fox News, and that was because you may have heard that uh, Beto O'Rourke, one of the presidential candidates, said there can be no reward, no benefit, no tax breaks for anyone that denies the full rights and the full civil rights of every single one of us. And so he was saying if there are churches who are against gay marriage, they should lose their tax exemption. And so he's made a, several strong statements that are a little bit out there, and that would, that would be one of them. I, don't, I guess I never thought that I'd actually ever hear somebody say that, particularly as a presidential candidate. Um, so again, where I grew up you know, as a young fellow is way different than what we find ourselves today. The main problem with his statement is that it's a, uh, that a church's tax exemption is not a benefit or a privilege. He mischaracterized what it was, and that's because it's provided for in the U.S. Constitution as part of separation of church and state. So the, the church doesn't get to tax, the, uh, the state doesn't get to tax the churches, and the church doesn't give money to the state to get benefits from the state and so on like that. So there needs to be and should be a, a separation. And that's why that's there, not to give benefits to churches. Now, the difficulty, though, uh, is then this was discussed by, you see the gentleman on the left. It was discussed um, with this gentleman. His name's Robert Fowler, and he's a Democratic strategist. And I thought his statement that he made about this situation was unfortunate because it still talked about us and churches. Again, this is, um, oops, this is how um, culture does things. If I could push the right button, this would go a lot better. There we go. And he said, churches shouldn't be worried about the IRS. They should be having a bigger conversation with their maker. I grew up in church my entire life. And one thing I was taught from day one is that Jesus is love and his love is limitless. So if you're gonna limit Jesus, I think you're doing more harm to your faith than good by excluding certain people. That was his thought. Well, my thought was, well, um, Richard, I, I talk to my maker every day, actually several times a day, every day. I'm having a lot of conversations with my maker and my maker keeps telling me to, to stay with scripture. So that's kind of where I am and, and he must not see the thing. Now the problem is that when he says that, you see that particularly that part highlighted in the yellow, Jesus' is love and his love is limitless. That's how he based his argument. So by that way of thinking, if Jesus is love, then you can't say no to anyone or anything, right? Because I mean, that's, that's, that was the issue here. Jesus is love, so you can't say no uh, to any, any uh, gay marriage kind of issues. So if you can't say no to anything or anybody, well, then there's a problem. So let me tell you a story about my, about my son. I had a son that was a toddler. You know, toddlers are where they're kind of a chunky body but don't have a whole lot of muscle in their legs yet because they're learning how to walk. And so they, they toddle, that, you know, and you keep thinking, I hope he doesn't fall down, but I'm not sure. And so he's toddling along and we had, I guess it would be an antique. My, uh, my wife's grandmother made this thing it's, uh, it's like a three-level set of little shelves. I don't know, a knick-knack shelf for you know, stuff that you might put on it. it was a, but it was a, a spool shelf, I think maybe they call it. So basically what you got, you got three pieces of wood, right? They're little triangles, three pieces of wood. And then, then through them, you've got a, a fairly thick wire, maybe, I don't know, eighth of an inch thick wire that goes through there, through each of the three corners. And on each of these wires, in between the shelves, you have spools, you know, from thread, right? 
So you actually have the spools, and so they make, and then they stain it all, and it's a nice brown color and something like that, and all the spools are strained, so it looks like a real piece, but it's not really, you understand that it's just wires and some spools, and it's kind of fragile. So I got this toddler boy, and he's, he's looking at it, and you know what's gonna strike the, the fear in parents' hearts? He grins really big. And he's looking at it with a big grin, and he starts toddling towards it. And worse than that, he sticks out a hand towards it as he's going. And I'm thinking, this is not gonna end well. You know, big heavy kid, can't control himself, little spindly thing that, you know. This. And so I said, no. And you know what he did? He looked at me and gave me the most angelic smile as he continued toddling towards it. And I said, no. If you do that, I'm gonna to have to spank you. Don't touch it. And you know what he did? He grinned even bigger and kept toddling right toward it. So I took him and I spanked him. He was not happy with me. I spanked him and I said, no, you can't touch that. Sent him off in a different direction. Now the message got home. I never saw him go towards that little, you know, that spindly little thing again. So that was good. But, but here's the thing. I'm looking at this statement by this democratic strategist who says, Jesus is love and love is limitless, so you can't say no to gay marriage. You can't say no to people who wanna do whatever they wanna do. So, so I guess what, I didn't love my son because I told him no and I spanked him? I don't think that's true, but that would have to be if you go with his logic. That would mean anything else that somebody wants to do. I'm really mad at you, you've been uh, cheating with my wife, I'm gonna shoot you. Well, you can't tell me no, because Jesus is love and love is limitless. Yeah, so I don't think that's a really good argument at all, but that was the argument that he used on national TV to say that, yeah, those Christians ought to be talking to their maker because they need to not exclude people. Now, I'll grant him a small piece. I don't think we should exclude people, but I think we should also deal with gay marriage as scripture talks about things. And so, so that's a whole nother thing. Um, I'm convinced that it's not love or truth, you see the headline, but it's really love and truth because I'm not willing to concede either one of them. What the gentleman that the democratic strategist said, he went completely on the love. You can't say anything because Jesus is love and love is limitless. He went all the way on the love side. He didn't want to talk anything about truth. You know what happens when you talk only about truth and you don't have any love? You know what that is? Well, one, you fail 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Two, you make a good Pharisee for somebody. So I think you really gotta have love and truth. And so I'm changing my slide. I think we need to have love and truth. So tonight I'd like to examine at least uh, in a starting way, homosexuality in the Bible. A little bit of a complex topic. And so in this discussion, there's often two clear sides, at least as I see it. One side says, would be gays who say something like, you can't help who you love, and the Bible talks about loving others, and Jesus talks about loving others, so affirm gays and their love for each other and gay marriage, and let's all move on. That's one side of, of the argument. And then another side of the argument is Christians who say, the Bible is very clear, very clear. Homosexual is a sin, it's wrong and shouldn't be permitted, and certainly not gay marriage, period, end of the story. Now, I have to tell you that I think both of those positions, as stated, are a bit extreme, and, and I don't think either one's exactly correct. They both have some value, and they both have some serious problems with those statements. And so we're gonna look at some of those kinds of things um, tonight and see about how that might work out for us. So resources, um, there's a handout that you got tonight and if you didn't let me know, but we can get you one. It talks about bibliography on homosexual issues in the church. It has 10 different authors on it. I've read every one of these books. So I mentioned earlier, when my, ch my culture challenges me, one of the things that I do is I go out looking for answers. So one of the things I do is I go and I start reading. I read all kinds of stuff. And these aren't all the books I've read, read. These are just the ones that I, I think are the best. 
So here are 10 good books that talk about the issue. I've also done something else. You notice on the front uh, by the person's name, if they've got an asterisk, I really like that book in particular. Those, so there are four of them that have asterisks and there's one that has two asterisks. I think Wesley Hill's book is my favorite. So if you say, I don't wanna read 10 books, but I'll read one, then I'd suggest you read one by Wesley Hill. But if you wanna read five instead of 10, then, then start with the ones with the asterisks. But all of them had really good material and, and good things in them. I like the ones that I marked with an asterisk because a lot of them were memoir kinds of writing. Not only did they talk scripture, not only did they talk about their faith, but they also talked about their life and where they were, how they got into it, and how they are today uh, as a person who might be same-sex attracted. So um, I really liked the, the standpoint of this is real people and they have real issues in real life and how do they live through and get through all of those things. On the back of this, it's profiles of the authors. So I took those five books that I thought were the best and there's a little paragraph telling you something about that person and, and what their life is and their profile and who they are and something like that. So you can kind of look through those and see if any of those profiles say, hey, that's somebody that I'd like to read what they've got to say. And you can look at that. So I wanted you to, to have that as a possibility to look at. Uh, and by the way, I've got it, you know, I mean, I did this in Microsoft Word and if, you, if somebody says, hey, can you give it to me electronically? I can, just send me an email and I'll send you, you know, a copy of this instead of paper. So one of the authors in this list is a fellow named Preston Sprinkle. I just laugh at his last name, but I guess, you know, I thought Apon was funny, but that, maybe that's funnier. Anyway, Preston Sprinkle, I like his statement about love and truth. And he said, homosexuality is not about either truth or love. It's about both truth and love. Since truth is loving and love is truthful, our God is both. And I'd like to wholeheartedly stand with him in that statement. Uh, I don't believe you can get one without the other. If you do love without truth, then you just get schmaltzy emotion. If you do truth without love, then you have a hard-nosed theoretical idea, but it may not have anything to do with people. And so I don't think either one of them by themselves is good enough. I think you need both. <clears throat> I'm acutely aware that I have the opportunity here to offend both sides in this discussion. And I'd prefer to offend no one, but I'm not sure if that's possible. But I do want to address the issue. And, and, I've, and I, I thought a long time about, about talking about this material. I've seen people fired from jobs because they made statements about gay marriage or whatever. And I'd rather not get fired from my job, but be that as it may, my thought is, well, what's my responsibility? My responsibility is to look at scripture. In particular, I, I would think that not only am I bothered by the way my culture is going, but some of you might be bothered by the way culture is going also. And so I wanted to give you some benefit of my reading and my looking for answers and the things that I've found. And certainly, you don't have to take my word for it. You can read all those books. And again, those are just my 10 favorite books, but there's even more out there, a lot of them. It was possible to offend both sides. Uh, so climb in the saddle, put your seat belts on, and here we go. A topic this important, this complex, and this large will not be covered in one evening. So you're not gonna get everything that comes out of these 10 books in one evening. You're not even gonna get, every, get everything that I think about the topic in one evening. Uh, but I've chosen therefore for tonight to look more specifically at the love side of the discussion first. And um, since I'm a Christian, I'm gonna hold the Christian's feet to the fire first and look at love. This seems fair to me since I'm a Christian. So I'm not gonna give somebody else scrutiny that I'm not willing to take myself and be assured that truth will also have its turn of having its feet held to the fire. So you all have known me for a while and you know every so often I will substitute in for Ryan when he's doing something else. And so tonight's one time and so I'll continue this topic at a later time, whenever that might be, and I don't have any particular time that that might happen, but when I do, then I'll continue on with, uh, with a continuation of this discussion. So what fire will feet be held to? To what fire? I should do that better in English. Scripture. So 
I want both Christians and non-Christians to be held to what scripture has to say. And scripture is the ultimate authority for a Christian. So for us in this crowd, if we think we're Christians and I think I'm a Christian, then scripture is the ultimate authority and that's where we really gotta go for things. Um, now it's also important that it's the ultimate authority is not, just, is not our Christian traditions. And it's not our denominational traditions. I'm a Southern Baptist, I've been a Southern Baptist all my life. I like Southern Baptists. I like Southern Baptist theology, I like Southern Baptist doctrine, but that's not enough to just have some good Southern Baptist ideas. And it's not about our feelings or our preferences. A lot of our culture seems to be stuck on, this is the way I feel and you can't tell me no because it's true for me even if it's not true for you. And if I feel this way, that's the way it should go. And I don't believe that. I don't think that it should be based on our feelings or our preferences, but I think it should be based on right and wrong and right and wrong we find in scripture. And then God's word, the Bible, is our perfect standard against which everything else is measured. So uh, if you tell me whatever I've said is wrong, I, I very well might be, but what I'm gonna wanna know is what part of scripture you think that says that what I've said is wrong and why are you making the claim of something else and where's the scripture? Because ultimately I'm gonna go back to scripture and say this is what I think and, and why do I think that? So <clears throat> in the journal, Suicide and life-threatening behavior. Now, doesn't that sound like an academic journal that you've always wanted to read? Suicide and life-threatening behavior. It's a 2014 study uh, reported in that journal. And they said same-sex attracted teens are two to seven times more likely to attempt suicide than teens who aren't. Now, first of all, my thought is that sounds like a tragedy and I wish it wasn't that way. But for us as Christians, it gets worse. Furthermore, teens who seek help from religious leaders are more likely to kill themselves than those who seek help from non-religious counselors. That I regret. Now, I'm not the religious leader who's counseled some teen who's same-sex attracted, so I can't say that I, I was on the front lines, but I regret being a Christian and hearing this kind of statistic. You're welcome to disagree with statistics and say, hey, you can find a bunch of other statistics that go the other way, and I'm fine with you finding something better or better in statistics. But even that there's even the possibility of a statistic that says teens that go to religious leaders commit suicide more often than if they go to non-religious leaders is a huge regret for me. And I'd rather not see it that way. What that does is starts me thinking, so, okay, so why is that? And... Do I have any part in that somehow, even peripherally? And I'm happy I can say that word. So um, how do these statistics compare with scripture? So again, I mentioned earlier that statistics are one thing and that's good, but I really wanna know what scripture has to do with things. So let's look for instance at Luke chapter 15 and verse one. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him, talking about Jesus is the hymn. Well, that's interesting. If tax collectors and sinners felt condemned by Jesus, if they were excoriated by Jesus, would they have been drawn to him? I don't think so. Tax collectors and sinners were drawing near to hear Jesus. Jesus is my leader. He's my Lord. As my Lord, he gets to tell me what to do and how to be. And the tax collectors and sinners were drawn to Jesus. That gave me a moment of conviction. Would the tax collectors and sinners and gay people, would they be drawn to me to hear what I have to say? It gives me some conviction because, uh, you know, everybody I'm sure has their they're leaning towards love or truth. And I lean towards truth more than I do love. I'm more likely to be a Pharisee than a schmaltzy you know, person with bad doctrine. But I don't think tax collectors and sinners and maybe gay people would, would be drawn to me if all I've got to say is this is the truth and I want you to hear what the truth is if I also don't have some kind of love. One of the comments in one of the books that I read said something like, 
the church is pushing gay people away from the church. You know, of course, my thought is, what do you mean by that? Well, they said, because when they come to church, they don't feel accepted in any way. Not even talking about their sexual identity or attitudes, but they don't feel accepted in any way. And when they go to the gay community, they find acceptance. What's a really strong thing in everybody's life? Acceptance. So somehow, we in the church have to be able to do both love and truth. I'm not interested in giving up the truth, but I think I could do better on the love side. And I'm kind of thinking maybe that's true of a lot of Christians and Christianity. If we're following Jesus and we're doing what Jesus does, if we're disciples of Jesus, we should learn what he does and do what he does. And if Jesus met with tax collectors and sinners and they were drawn to hear him, we got some work to do to get people who are not like us, who we think are sinners to come in and be a part of this fellowship. Were tax collectors and sinners leaving a conversation with Jesus and killing themselves? No, they weren't. And yet that statistic said a number of teens talked to religious leaders and more of them committed suicide after talking to religious leaders than non-religious leaders. Somehow, some of us, maybe all of us in here are doing really well, but somehow some of us who call ourselves Christians are not doing a good job of showing love for people and acceptance of them, at least on a human level. Because they're not reacting to us the way they reacted to Jesus. I desire for our church, Utica, and Christianity in general to be like Jesus. So let's talk about tax collectors in Jesus' day. What do you know about tax collectors? They're bad guys. I recently saw my property tax bill from the county and it was $3,000 plus. Now I see it once a year. So it's like, not that this should be a surprise, but every time I see a tax bill that says $3,000, it just makes my heart skip a beat. And I've got a pacemaker, so that's really hard. And, uh, as, and my, my, my feeling is I can't afford to retire. How in the world am I ever gonna pay my property tax if I retire? I can't be doing that. Now, that's an emotional reaction. And when I think about it, I go, you know, it's really not that bad. It's something of a shock, but it's really not that bad. And I've got provisions and I'll be fine and I'll do just well. But somehow, seeing $3,000 on a bill, I grew up uh, as a kid, my family didn't have uh, enough money to buy me more than one pair of shoes. I grew up back in the day when kids wore leather shoes to school. They don't anymore. You gotta have not only tennis shoes, but you know, $150 tennis shoes. But back in my day, Everybody wore tennis shoes. And I had to make a choice. My mom asked me what I want to do. We don't have enough money to buy you two. And I said, I got to have tennis shoes for gym and I need to participate in gym. So let's buy me tennis shoes. And I bought tennis shoes and I was made fun of by the kids at school. I got a nickname for a while, the tennis shoe kid. I didn't really feel happy about that because they were making fun of me and I didn't enjoy that. So I still come back from that mentality of growing up in that kind of circumstances, and I look and I go, $3,000. Now, that seems like a lot of money to me, but you know what I gotta do is I just gotta write a check, put it in the mail, and give it to the government, and it's done and gone. But back in their day, tax collectors were different. A tax collector with a couple of armed Roman soldiers would approach you in your home and say, you owe $3,000 for taxes, and additionally, you're gonna need to pay a $3,000 processing and handling fee. So give us the $6,000 now. And if you don't give it to us, we're gonna rearrange your face, literally. So that wasn't a happy circumstance. Whatever they could get out of somebody was fair game as far as Roman government's concerned. As long as they got their $3,000, they didn't care what else the guy did and sent along the Roman soldiers to help him out. So you can see why tax collectors were hated in, in, uh, in Israel. And tax collectors, were all Jewish. They didn't have the Roman guys go collect taxes. They they made them enforcers, but they didn't make them. It was the Jews who did it, and therefore 
you know, looking at those Jews, they're turncoats and traitors and oppressors of your own people. They really hated those guys. Not only did they take money out of their pockets, but they were supposed to be Jews taking care of Jews and they didn't. So according to Luke chapter 15, verse one, the tax collectors, even those guys that were hated by the rest of the Jews, they were drawn to Jesus. You know, would it be a temptation if you were standing in Jesus's place to say, you're a tax collector, aren't you? Do you realize that as a tax collector, when you take more than the tax, that you're hurting your own people? You know what, that would be true. I would have a tendency to do the true and not the love part. But they were attracted to Jesus, so he must not have done what I just described. Matthew, remember him? He wrote one of the gospels. And he was one of the 12 disciples. Matthew was a tax collector. Now, interesting thought, you think Jesus gave him a pass? You probably meant well as a tax collector. Personal opinion, I don't think he got a pass. I think somewhere along the way, walking around with Jesus for three years and sleeping out under the stars, somewhere along the way, I bet Jesus and Matthew had some conversations. But he, he was able to call Matthew and Matthew was willing to follow him. Jesus was willing to call Matthew a, a, a dastardly tax collector. And the tax collector was willing to follow a religious leader. That seems strange. Let's look at John chapter eight, verses one through 11. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came to the temple and the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, placing her in the midst. They said to him, teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What do you say? They're sneaky devils. This they said to test him that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Uh, what I'm surprised is they had integrity enough not to throw a stone anyway. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. They had more sense, maybe some wisdom. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. You know what the penalty for adultery was in their day? Well, it was death, because when they talk about stoning, they just didn't mean just throw one rock at somebody. They meant throw rocks at them until they're dead. That's what stoning was. Use as big a rock as you can actually comfortably throw. You don't throw pebbles. You throw something intending to kill them because that was their method of death for some people. And stoning was the penalty for adultery. Now, I do find it interesting that the woman's there, not the man, because Scripture is also really clear when you read it in the Old Testament uh, that the adultery was both for the man and the woman. Somehow, the guy wasn't there, and I don't know why, but that doesn't seem right somehow. So Jesus, uh, Jesus, did Jesus condemn her and give her over to death? No, he said, neither do I condemn you. That sounds a lot on the love side, doesn't it? So do we stop the account here? No condemnation? Does she get away scot-free? Well, actually I didn't show the end, the end of verse 11. What I showed you was this. She said, no one, Lord, and Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. See that semicolon? That means I didn't show you the end of it. Here's the rest of the verse. Go, and from now on, sin no more. 
Jesus didn't give her a break saying, oh, it's all right, honey, don't worry about it. If you have another affair, you get some more adultery, just come back to me, we'll take care of it, no big deal, no harm, no foul. Jesus said he didn't condemn her, but then he said, go and from now on, sin no more. Jesus didn't say it wasn't sin what she did. So in Luke chapter 19, verses 110, we see the following. He entered Jericho and was passing through and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to, to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down for I must stay at your house today. So he heard and came down and received him joyfully. Tax collector, religious leader, received him joyfully. And when they saw it, all those other people in the crowd, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Have you ever seen people look at somebody else and saying they're sinning in that tone of voice? He's gone in to be the guest of a man who's a sinner. They grumbled and they weren't happy about it. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, behold, behold Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. And for the son of man came to seek and save the lost. For the son of man came to seek and save the lost. You know what? All of us were lost at one point. Every one of us. And Jesus came to seek and save each one of us. Tax collectors that abused their power and cheated people, he came to save them. Prostitutes who wiped Jesus' feet with their hair, he came to save prostitutes. Just what do you think would happen if somehow or another here in this day and age, a woman known to be a prostitute came up to our pastor and cried and wiped his feet with her hair. You'd better put a stop to that pretty fast, don't you think? Jesus didn't put a stop to it. In fact, the other people got mad at him for it. What about those people found in adultery? Those would be straight people, not talking about gays here. Straight people having problems with sex. He came to save those lost people? I would guess somewhere in our church, somebody's committed adultery. Does God love them? You know, if he wrote a whole bunch of sins on the ground, like some people speculate, he might have hit one that hit me. How about gay people? Did Jesus come to seek and save the lost, including gay people? If Jesus is intending to seek and save the lost, and if, if some gay people are lost, don't we have some kind of responsibility to be Jesus' hands and feet here on this earth and somehow, and I don't know how, but somehow interact with those gay people to point out to them that the Lord loves them and that he wants them uh, to be a part of them. He came to save them as well as us. So loving people in spite of their behavior doesn't mean affirming their behavior. That's important. Did I love my son who disobeyed me when I said no? Sure I did. He was disobedient, that little scamp. He heard me say no, he looked at me and smiled and kept going. He knew what I was saying. He knew, no, by the way, you know, that, we'd, we'd gone through that one several times before this event. 
Did I love my son who disobeyed me? Yeah, I did. Do you find that sometimes you love someone who sins despite the fact that they sin? Anybody in your life like that? How about your own spouse? Your spouse ever sin? Do you love them anyway? How about your own children? Have your own children ever sinned and do you love them anyway? Grandchildren? Now my grandchildren haven't sinned because they're not old enough to know anything yet. But have you had grandchildren that have sinned and you still love your grandchildren? I bet we all have somebody in our life that we love and care about deeply who still have sinned. So if we look at gay people and we say, you're a sinner, well, we'd be right. But if they look back at me and said, Randy, you're a sinner, they'd be right. So how would we do with people and how they interact with each other? So then can we love gay people despite the sin that we see? Let me close with a story about two ladies named Amy and Rachel. Amy started teasing her girlfriend and said, let's just go for fun. We'll see how much we can push their buttons. Uh, Amy's friend Rachel didn't like the idea of hanging around with a bunch of Christians. Come on, Amy, and such as I hear their motto is, come as you are. I just want to prove that they come as you are unless you're gay. So Amy had been in a nine-year lesbian relationship that had broken up just a little while ago, leaving her wondering why her deepest longings could never be satisfied. She and Rachel had started hanging out when they decided to attend one Sunday morning. And she says, I came on a mission to shock people. Rachel and I would hold hands in front of people, but instead of the disgusted looks of contempt we expected, pause. I'm disappointed that gay people would think like that about people in church, that they expect disgust and contempt and hate from Christian people. Okay, back to the story. Um, but instead of the disgusted looks of contempt we expected, people met eyes with us and treated us like real people. So we started coming to church weekly. We kept moving closer to the front each week trying to get a reaction so that we'd get rejected sooner rather than later. When we couldn't shock people, we stopped trying and we started learning. Not long after that, Rachel and I stopped seeing each other, but I kept coming to church because I was searching for something, Amy admits. I definitely wasn't looking to change, hear that? She came to church, but she wasn't uh, coming to change. It wasn't my lesbian lifestyle that I was bringing to God. But I wondered if God had answers to my deeper longings. Problem was, I didn't trust God at all. The more I listened and learned about the teachings of Jesus, the more I started to actually believe that God really did love me. I heard more and more about his masterpiece, and in time, I actually started to believe it. And the more I believed God could actually see something of value in me, the more I trusted him. Over time, Amy slowly opened her heart and struggles to Christ. It took several years, but as I moved closer and closer to Christ, he gently took me on a very surprising journey and she gets into some really uh, difficult, intimate details that I'm not going to read at this point. But she went on a journey that looked at a lot of things in her life in the past. And the result of all of that looking and learning is eventually she became a Christian. And her statement is that God delivered her from uh, her le lesbian desires. And now she is serving in her church in a ministry of people that deal with sexual issues and relationship issues. And she has a ministry in that church helping other people like she had been. So when I read that story, I said, what would happen at Utica? I don't know. I think all of you as good people, but I don't guess I really know. 
So if a lesbian couple comes in handing, holding hands, and that might be okay, because you know women hold hands more than guys, but what if a couple of guys came in holding hands? How would we react to them? Would we shun them, get in the seat as far away possible from wherever they are? Or would we be like this church and meet them in the eye, talk to them and welcome them with us? When she started going to that church, she had no intentions of changing her lesbian orientation, none. But she had a need that she didn't know how to fill. And she heard about Jesus and what he did and figured out that Jesus was gonna fill what she needed that she couldn't fill some other way, including her lesbian relationships. And when she came to Jesus as her savior and he filled her and met the needs that she had that nobody else and no other way she could get them fulfilled, at least for her, her lesbian desires left. That's not true for every gay person, by the way, but that was her testimony. She didn't come here wanting to give up being gay. She came up here because she had a need. So when gay people come to our church, are they welcomed at least on a level of being human? Are they made to feel welcome, come here and study God's word with us? Can someone come to this church and know that they'll be able to hear about Jesus here, no matter who they are and what they've done? And you can go beyond gay people. That was the topic kind of the night. What if there were two people who were openly doing uh, an adulterous relationship and they wanted to come to our church? Would they be welcomed here? Even though they're living in sin? And you can pick your sin. What if it's a known sin and they wanna come here? Are they welcome to hear about Jesus here? Whatever their sin is? I don't know, that's not, that's not normal human-wise. It could happen if the Holy Spirit's in us. Let's pray.